Hey everyone, uh, welcome again to a, another one of the live streams. It's definitely mine and Spencer's highlight of the week where we just get to goof around and, and talk to some people because it's uh, you know a bit, bit boring at the moment not being able to go out and visit people like we normally would be so it's nice to do this virtually with you all. So thanks very much for joining us, we do appreciate it. Um, even if you're watching the recording of course we appreciate that as well, just it's quite nice to know that what we're doing here is helping out people so really really enjoy the fact that everyone's getting engaged and watching along with us um yeah again as normal let us know where you are spencer do you wanna so we actually we haven't even introduced ourselves have we so okay if this is your first live stream um spencer's laughing at me now i'm getting too confident at these live streams so i forgot I forget the basics uh, if this is your first live stream um my name is richard stubbley i'm a process specialist based out of birmingham uk We've got a big tech centre there with lots of good good machines and you know lots of interesting bits of kits. Um, so yeah, that's me, Spence. Yeah, Spencer Hardcastle, working on the same team as Rich in the uh, process specialist team. Um, and I've been working at Autodesk for seven years now, uh, focusing on Fusion 360 at the moment. And uh, glad to be back on the live streams, really enjoying it. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. So come on, if this is your first live stream, um, let us know who you are, let us know where you are. If this isn't your first live stream, let us know who you are and let us know where you are. Um, yeah, I really want to hear from those those people that are f uh, new to the live streams. Um, let, let us know in the chat who you are, who you work for, what you've been doing with Fusion. We really want to hear from everyone. So in the chat, let's hear from you. Yeah, that'd be cool. I hear, because again, for those of you who don't know how this roughly works, I'll do the presenting, Spencer is manning the chat, so he'll be looking after that and interrupting me when I take a millisecond breath every now and then. Um, so yeah, Spencer will, will let me know what you guys are saying. He's let me know already that we've got um, ice cream, is it 82? 62. 62, ice cream 62. Uh, can't be with us live today like he normally is, but um, yeah, he'll be watching us um on the recording so yeah we get we're getting to know a few regulars now coming Absolutely. through a cash doll from yeah India. there we go so that's definitely not the first time so yeah no that's good okay everyone um hope you're all on board let's let's get started in this again please talk to the spencer on the on the live chat we do want this to be interactive not just me talking to you because that's pretty damn boring hmm. right Engraving. This came up as a topic um, about three or four weeks back now. So we, what we're trying to do is ask you, ask you all, what, what do you want to hear from us, and we'll try and do a live stream around that. Of course, we can't do everything. But, um, so please, please put back in the chat what you want to see next week, the week after, the week after that, and we'll do our best to facilitate this. Engraving came up as one. So um, Spencer and myself trawled through the forums, had a quick look at the problems people were having with engraving. Um, and we, we've tried to basically make a quick live stream today around those problems and how to solve them. The first one is how to define my tool correctly. So tool library, this is the new tool library that came out as default in the last release. So that's what we're gonna work with today. I'm gonna make a new tool here. And then what we wanna do is we wanna define a chamfer mill. So there's not a yeah, there's, there's not a tool here that's for engraving tool only, but the chamfer mill will give you all the flexibility you need to create an engraving tool. So click on chamfer mill, and then again, I can put my description here. I'm not going to bore everyone with doing that. I've then got my cutter page. This is the important one. So the the really important ones here is the diameter. So what diameter of the cutter have you? Let's, let me make a six mil cutter. Helps if I put it there. The shaft diameter is going to default to the tool diameter. The tip diameter, now this is the important one. If you've got your tool that comes down to a very point, you're going to want to set that to zero. So what that's going to do then, as you can see here, is bring the tool right to a dead point at the end of it. Overall length, length below holder, you all know what that is. Flute length, again, not too important on this type of tool because 
the the fact that the the cutter is coming down to a point will actually probably override that so i can drop that down to sort of 10 um, and you'll see what will happen the yellow portion drops down but we know that's the cutter portion um, if you were clever enough you could put a little calculation in there to actually work out what the flute length is based off the angle um, you know you could do a bit of trigonometry to work that out and then this is the confusing one now taper angle this was what we found when we were looking through the forums no one knew I've got a 30 mil tool, do I put 30 mil, do I put 15 mil, do I put 60 mil, degrees, sorry, degrees, do I put 15 degrees, 30 degrees, 60 degrees, what do I specify in there? So I've made everyone this little slide. Hopefully this is going to sort of explain what we're doing. So because we're defining this as a chamfer mil, you've got to think when we're chamfering, we're only using one side of the cutter. So what we call taper angle inside of fusion on that image there is the same as degrees per slide so that's what we've got there is we've got degrees per slots slide degrees per side is the taper angle and then the inclusive angle is you know, the overall the whole angle of that cutter is everyone following this along spence so far, so good. Cool, let's keep going. Um, so you can see there, a, to do a standard chamfer on a part is normally 45 degrees. So the inclusive angle is 90, the taper angle is 45. So if you buy a 30 degree engraving tool, the chances are they're probably talking about inclusive angle with engraving tools, whereas chamfer tools mean normally degrees per slide, uh, side. That's gonna catch me out all today, that is. So what you want to do there is just have a look and work out are, is your tool defined as an inclusive angle or a degrees per side? And all you need to put in is the degrees per side. Hopefully you can all div divide your inclusive angle by two um, to get it in there. So hopefully that's clear enough. Please let us know in the chat if I didn't explain that well and we can jump back into this and I can talk about it some more. But that's what you've got to think about is when you normally buy a chamfer mill, they'll be um, quoted in degrees per side, which is the taper angle inside of fusion. When you buy engraving tools, they're sometimes defined in inclusive angle, and all you've got to do is just halve that and then put that in as the taper angle. The way I try and remember this, if it ever looks a bit weird, and I can't remember which way around it is, I put 45 degrees in the taper angle, and then you can obviously see by looking at the squares and the blue graph paper behind, that it's a 45 and it's a 90 degree inclusive. So you can sort of put that in as a little default. So you can just count the squares and gone, right, I've gone three across and three up. So that means that it's, you know, a 45 degree um, angle on that bit of the picture. So hopefully that's cleared up a bit of ambiguity around that that people have said on the forums. Um, again, if I haven't explained it well, let me know and I'll come back to it. Everyone happy so far, Spence? Yeah, so far so good. We've got um, Andrew checking in from Texas. Ooh. We've got Thomas also from Texas. Um, Fred Genius. I don't know whether that's his second name or a descriptive word. <laughs> um, wants to know about engraving around the cylinder. Okay. We've got Carl from South Africa checking in again. A, uh, a Hi, Carl. Good to see you again. Viewer. We had him last time as well. Um, and then a question about SVG imports, um, wanting to know about engraving with SVGs. Um, to insert an SVG, go up to the insert icon, top right hand corner of the, of the toolbar in the design workspace. Once that's in, all you need to do is project that onto a surface using project to surface and then do exactly the same, um, strategy as what Rich is, Rich is going to show you today. So I hope, hope that clears up. If it doesn't, let us know in the chat. Yeah, the one who um, said about engraving along a cylinder, if you could just put some more information in um, the chat and hopefully I'll be able to cover that. I might be covering it already with these exclamation marks um, later. But yeah, again, everyone, please let us know what you, what you have understood, what, what's missing, and we'll do our best to cover it. We try and keep these half an hour, but they normally run a bit over um, because, yeah, you don't want to listen to me talk for ages. So we've got some complete toolpaths here. I'll be going over, I'll make all these. I'm gonna try and show you why the engraving toolpath is so good um, on this bit of tapered 
um, line here. I'm then going to talk about the difference between model text versus the, just the sketch text from inside of Fusion. So you can see here that all I did was I sketched the text there and then extruded it. And then I sketched the text here and I didn't extrude it. So I'll just show you the difference between selecting extruded text and, and just the text from the sketch as well. And then I'm also going to show you some little problems you might come across uh, with doing shapes, a bit like these exclamation marks, because it's quite a nice shape. Um, one of them is like a, what is it, trapeze, trapezoid shape? I don't know, rhombus? I can't, no, not a rhombus. Anyway, let's forget my sort of, you know, primary school education there. Obviously didn't go very well. And then a circle, because circles are a big problem with engraving tools. So let's just get into it. We've got 2D and we've got engraved. This is an amazing toolpath. Um, little backstory, I got married two years ago. I nearly got that wrong then. Um, and it's two, yeah, two years ago. Oh, I was worried then. So I got married two years ago and I've got a little den for Nova Mill in the garage and I engraved out of oak a name badge for everyone at the wedding. Thankfully, we only had about 65 guests, so it was really easy. Um, but yeah, this was an amazing toolpath. Gave us some really nice lettering and I'm going to explain why it's so good now. So what it does is it varies the Z height dependent on how far the tool can get into that um, pocket, into that bit of geometry. So let me just quickly sort of activate that folder so they all jump in there. So we're going to go 2D, engrave. It's already selected that tool for me. I'm going to choose my top contour and I'm just going to hit OK. That's all I'm going to do for the moment. And I'm going to get a nice tool path there. So to see what's going on, I'm just going to quickly section this. So inspect, section analysis, and I imagine some of you are going, now what? I never knew I could do that. Yeah, so section analysis came out, I'm going to guess six months ago, but I have no clue. Um, and yeah, really, really cool. So if I just go on the side now, you'll see that this line goes up. Because, as you'd imagine, the, the line is tapered. So what it's doing is, let's simulate this and really have a really delve deep into what's going on here. So let's simulate on there. Let's turn my stock off. So at the start here, the tool effectively looks at how deep it can go in. So let's just pick those corners out and then let's go in. Um, I wonder if it's any better with, oh, yeah, there we go. So it's probably better without that actually. So you can see there, the edge of the tool is touching both sides of my contour so it cannot go any deeper um, down into into that that contour there it's as far down as that can go without of course breaking outside of that contour so that's really clever uh, it's not looking at the bottom height of my pocket I, I modeled up there it's just looking at how deep that tool can get in so of course if I had a, a steeper angle um, so a 30 degree or a 60 degree tool um, rather than a 90 degree inclusive angle tool here then of course that could go deeper down. So that's what you've got to sort of weigh up of, you know, of course, um, the the more acute the angle, the more acute your inclusive angle becomes, the more definition you can pick out. Um, because of that whole thing, it looks of, it doesn't want to break outside of that contour. So what happens then is, as I go down, if I just look at this view here, let me just quickly run along here. As I go down, the toolpath, if I can show this any better, you'll see that, there we go, look now I'm going down the toolpath, the tool's rising as it's going down. That's because of course, when it gets down to the very end here, you can see it's hardly in that pocket because the tool is just respecting those edges and making sure it stays in. So this is the whole purpose of this engraving toolpath. It's really clever, works brilliantly, but you've got to understand why it does certain things because sometimes you're like, well, why hasn't it machined that bit of that, that lettering? And it's because of that whole thing of it's, it's respecting the tool and making sure it doesn't cut over your contour selection. So sometimes you'll need to actually um, use a different tool. You need to use a tool with a, a, a more acute inclusive angle, acute less, obtuse more so there we go that's what we've got on there so that's sort of explaining how that toolpath works right we've now got the be all and end all of fonts Arial. um 
I think that just shows that alphabetically people know it because it's the first one that ever gets chosen normally. So let's have a look at engraving this. So I'm going to go back to engrave. By the way, if you click 2D chamfer, it doesn't work. I spent about five minutes, couldn't work out why I couldn't make a toolpath earlier, and that's because I went 2D chamfer. So I use 2D engraving for engraving, it works a lot better. Um, I'm going to go back on my geometry tab, and I'm just going to go around and select the top contour of this. Again, definitely the top contour, because again, it doesn't matter how deep my how deep my pocket is, it's just going to respect that contour and put the tool in there. Um, there we go. So, I'm not sure what you'd call this letter, the, these characters, but where you've got two lots of geometry, so like zeros, O's, sixes, P's, B's, D's, R's, anything where it's got geometry in geometry, you've got to select both. And I'll show you why in a second. But you've seen I've gone through and I've selected all those letters. I'm going to hit OK now. And I get my toolpath showing up there. Really nice. It works in. And you can see what happens, what, why it's so clever, is when it comes to a corner, it actually knows what it can do is ramp up into that corner till the tip effectively dis disappears onto the top of your job and then back down again. So uh, rather than just sweeping that around and going through, we look if we can jump up into there and then come back down. Really clever. Um, yeah, don't know how on earth they thought of how to do that properly, but it, it, it works amazingly. So even with a large tool, you can get definition. So if you imagine, if you've got like a 10 mil tool, of course, as you step down and down and down that diameter, you end up with a 0.0001 diameter tool at the very tip. And we utilize that and we go up into that corner and then back down again. It gives you really crisp lettering. Our wedding guests were very happy with their name badges. How are we doing on the chat, Spence? We're doing very well. We're doing very well. We've got uh, our very own Dylan Smith oh. on the call. Hi, Dylan. How are you doing? Afternoon, Dylan. Um, we've got Moid. He's learning the software, and our videos are helping him out a lot. So he says thank you. That's Thanks. really nice to hear. No, we really appreciate knowing that it's all worthwhile. It keeps us motivated. And uh, Fred Genius. Um, gave us some more information on his uh, engraving around a cylinder. Uh, so his example was the numbers on a lathe dial. Oh, okay, so, so I get what you mean, wrapped, are, it's wrapped exactly. around. Okay, I'm with you. We've had a okay. few questions around that same topic, actually. Um, a cash, uh, sorry, not a cash, it was driver 944S. Um, similar question, but the cylinders tapered at 20 degrees. So okay, I might have to make some examples of this and go for, go for this for next week. I'm not going to yeah. waste time doing, but I'll, I'll make some examples up of these. And even if we're not doing engraving next week, I'll quickly just do a few minutes on that. For but, sure. And then we got a quick question about tool wear. Okay. Um, is or does a cute angle? You're talking about the angle yeah. of the tool. Um, and tool wear. Do, uh, do they go hand in hand? So the more acute or the finer the angle of the tool, the higher the tool wear? So the, the problem you've got here is naturally the smaller something is, the weaker it is. So um, you potentially might break smaller tools. So if it's a really acute angle, a really small angle, um, you're going to risk breaking the tool. Two factors. One, it's smaller, it's weaker. There's not, there's not as much body there. But as well, it's going to go deeper into the pocket. So, of course, you're removing more material. So, you don't really look at tool wear too much with engraving. They're pretty much, you buy them, they're new, you wear them until they, they stop cutting efficiently and you throw them away. It's not like an end mill where you compensate for it and move it. Because they only ever cut really centre line and, and down, a, down a line and then just move off as they need to. We don't really ever look at tool wear. They just get to a point where they're worn beyond cutting efficiently and then you replace them. Like me with my machine downstairs, I don't like spending money on tools, so I use them and use them and use them until they pretty much burn the, the, the wood rather than cutting it. Um, that's bad practice. You should you know, look and see when it stops cutting it effectively and starts leaving burrs. You should really start changing your tools out. Perfect, so hopefully that answered the, the question. If not, let's hear why not in the chat and uh... Yeah, we'll it. again, yeah, I'm not offended if I've answered it wrong. Um, definitely not. So again, back to this here. I've got my toolpath on there. Let me now discuss modelled versus not modelled. 
you saw that I had to select all those letters. It wasn't too difficult. Fusion 360 is what, six, seven, eight, nine, nine characters. Quite easy. Again, you've got a few extra characters with the O's. Um, but of course, if it's the text, all you have to do is go engrave, click on the text, hit OK, and then you get that toolpath. Of course, the problem here is it's not modelled. Um, but what you can do, of course, is let me just go back to another step. I could turn my sketch back on up here, so it, it's modelled, and I've got my original sketch. I'm going to go 2D engrave, and the problem you've got here is it's quite difficult to select the geometry. So if any of you are watching a couple of weeks back with uh, Attack of the Contour, hold down your left click. It's going to show you everything that your mouse intersects and make sure you choose your sketch text. I'm going to hit OK. I'm going to then hide that sketch. And you can see it just stops me having to select all the characters or all the contours, sorry. Um, you can see why that would be so good on a huge toolpath, uh, a huge, not a huge toolpath, a huge um, character string. What are you laughing at, Spence? Nothing. 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 Cool. Okay, and I promised I'd explain about why you need to set both bits of geometry, so we'll look at that now. So um, let me get rid of that toolpath. Let me get rid of that toolpath. I've got that one there. I'm going to duplicate it, Control D. Hopefully, you're all getting these little shortcuts now and I'm just going to deselect so shift select to deselect please I hope you're all going wow this is amazing all these shortcuts you're teaching us so that's what we've got there so I've deselected it and you can see it's gone plowed straight through the middle and I'll show you why now and it, it's quite logical when you see what it's trying to do if we simulate this toolpath turn my stock on and what it's going to do now as it goes through machines all this 360 you can see because it doesn't know the inside it actually machines the whole of that O out correctly you know I told it that that was my geometry there and it's gone okay I'll, I'll cut that and it just puts the tool straight in respects the edges of the tool and the edges of the contour and then comes back out again so it's doing what it believes to be correct um, but just be aware it makes it doesn't catch you out if you've got I think they're called bubble letters letters where you've got contours inside of contours uh, make sure you set both of them because you know basically any r p o d g you get the idea all of those you need to select both or else you get something like that where it plunges in let's turn that model back on and let's get rid of that toolpath all right let's lift that up a touch um onto some lovely calligraphy font it's exactly the same I'm going to go in and go engrave. I'm going to do that little trick I spoke about just. I'm going to bring open the sketch that I did originally. I'm going to left click, make sure I choose that sketch text. I know that's a little bit longer and you think oh, I've got it right, but just trust me, do that. And it, you just know that you've chosen the right thing then. And I'm going to hit OK on there. So I've got my lovely engraving on there now. And what you can see here is it's jumping up these corners and cutting that. But the problem you get sometimes is it does it where you don't really want it. Um, we'll look at that a bit more later with some of the different fonts. But sometimes it's jumping up into these corners where you don't quite want it to do that. Um, it's trying to be a bit too fancy and pick out too much geometry. There's a tolerance for this. So if I go into edit here, edit the passes tab. And where it's got sharp corner angle... What it's basically trying to say is, what what do I define as a corner that I want to pick out with the tool? So let's it's 165 at the moment. Let's drop that down to 100, and you can see there that S is hasn't been picked out. Let me just undo Control Z, and it was picked out there. Really nice. Um, just allows you that little bit more control. We'll see this a lot in the example later, where it's a an, an O that's a bit segmented, and it like tries to jump up at loads of points to pick that corner out. We drop that down, and it solves that problem for us. Some of you might have seen something on there just that was multiple depths. This was a new thing that came out. Um, let me drop it down to 0.1 and hit OK. And what you're going to see now is it's going to basically go down and cut loads. This wasn't out there, again, I can't, let's say a year ago. Um, so 
you know, get the party poppers out, um, it's in and it works really nicely. So all it's going to do is mean you don't plunge your cutter straight down, you do it in multiple passes and cut up. And again, it respects the geometry and cuts it up here. So yeah, really nice, works well. Um, especially if you're cutting difficult materials with delicate tools, multiple passes, really useful. But yeah, everyone happy so far? Everyone going well? This this live streams are going well actually. I'm, I haven't had any problems so far. Everyone's loving it, Rich. You're doing a great job. Uh, we've got some uh, some topics for next time. Go on, let's go for them. Isolation milling for PCBs could be a topic potentially. What what we're offering in that area? Yeah, I'm not doing that one. <laughs> uh, a quick a question actually for you. A bit of an opinion question, I think. Um, what depth would you recommend? To have a nice clear engraving, how how deep would you? Do oh, it? how long's a piece of string? It's it's twice as long as half of it. <laughs> um, so yeah, very open ended question there. Um, it is going to completely depend on what material you've got and you know and what 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 cutters you're using to cut it with. What what I tend to think about um, again. So go, we'll go back a couple of steps. The the larger the angle of the tool, the less it goes down into the pocket. So what I'm going to try and probably normally do is if I like think of like the width of its cutting, I'm going to try and cut down at least the width of what's being cut. That's my rule of thumb. Um, that's sort of how I, I, I judge it. Again, I haven't got any science to back that up. It's just what I've found to work well. So, you know, there if I've got sort of two mil um, width across there, I'll try and choose a cutter that can go about two mil down. And that tends to work quite well um, from what, from what I've seen you know, as well, you know, so you just gotta have a look really and work out what you wanna do. Um, different materials look different engraved. Um, another really nice one um, I've seen is paint something, then engrave it so you get different colors showing through. Um, some of you might have seen some things I've done before when I've anodized something, I've then engraved it um, on our hass um, and then it really pops out at you because you get like the, the nice aluminum metal finish come through from the anodizing. So that's another nice one as well. Brilliant. Thanks very much. I've also posed a question in the chat. Um, do you use V-Groove tooling regularly? Obviously, we're, we're using a, a chamfer type tool with Infusion to define this. So we've had a few responses in the chat, but let, let's hear from... From, from from everyone, do you use V-Groove tooling regularly? Like I said, we've had a few responses. Um, you, Christopher Walker is using the uh, these types of tools for engraving, but also for French cleats. Um, well, I had a little bit of a Google about what a French cleat is, and it's, it's for hanging cabinets and securing cabinets to a wall. So we've got Daiki. From, I hope I said that right. Apologies if I uh, if I pronounce your name wrong. From Japan, on the call, and Richard from Germany. So great to have you. Uh, Light noise in Japan. Yeah. That's dedication. That is. Thank you very much for joining us live. You can watch these recorded. We, 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 we're not offended if you want to actually you know sleep at some point today. Um, so let's have a quick look. I spoke about this a couple of weeks back. This is the Simplex font. So what this is going to do is produce a, a really straight line basically on there. So what I've got here, um, my toolpath I've got, can I show it, turn the model off. It's just going to produce a single line font. So I'll show you how I made that one up. Again, let's turn my completed ones off. I should stop cheating and using my completed ones. Again, choose the sketch text, got the engraving, hit OK, it really is that easy. And what it does now is it just goes in there. Oh, sorry, wrong one. Um, at least turn the model off, not sure that. And it's just going to go in and it's just going to pick out that simplex font really nicely and come down. Now this is where we need to look at our, um, I can't remember the name of it, what was it? The, the angle threshold basically. Look at that, oh, it's horrible. It's got these little flick up points here on it. I'm just going to drop that angle down so I don't get those on there. So let's edit this. Go into the passes, sharp corner angle, that's what I was after. Um, let's take it down to 50 degrees. Let's see what we get. Oh, look at that, so much nicer. So again, it's not gonna be very nice on the tool now because it's just gonna plunge straight in. But if you're just doing some real light engraving over something and you don't want double lined um, engraving, 
this is something that you, could be of interest to you. Um, again, it, I'm not saying it's right, I'm not saying it's the wrong way of doing it, but just showing you how different applications need different solutions. So this is just a way to do that simplex font. It's a real straight line, no frilly bits on it, and you're just going to be able to put some basic text onto something there as well. So a lot of people use this for like serial numbers where they're just lightly etching or engraving a serial number into a part. Let's turn that model back on. So these exclamation marks now. If I wanted to engrave it, I'm just going to go 2D, engrave, and let's select all my geometry again. Two, three, four. Hit OK. Brilliant. It's made a really nice toolpath. It's going in, it's picking these corners out, it's working fine for me. Let's now do this one. And let's watch it go horribly wrong and discuss why. Hit OK. So for a start, it hasn't even touched this. But it has touched this here. I need to turn my model off and show you though, it's gone below the surface. So that's it really important to know here is Fusion does not care how deep your pocket is. It's looking at the contour you selected and putting that that, that, that that tapered tool as deep in that contour as it's allowed to cut from the edges. You know, it does make sense, but it's just something to bear in mind um, what you're doing because this could cause you a big problem. You know, if you don't if you don't want it to go down, it's gonna do that. But of course, we've got a way of stopping it. Um, before I show you how to stop that from happening, a quick talk on why this hasn't worked. Because all it's going to try and do is spot drill with the tool, just plunge the tool straight in to create a circle. And of course it can't do that, it knows that's not good practice and it's not allowing you to do that. So options here would be to make that as an ellipse, um, and then what it will do is it knows it can come in and move around and come back out again. Because else again, a perfect circle, it will just have, the only way it can make that is just by plunging in. If you really want to do that, I don't recommend it, but if you really want to, I'd do a drilling toolpath, and it's just going to go in and spot that and drill that like that. So if you really wanted to do it, that's how you're going to do that. Engraving won't let you do that um, by default. So what I'm going to do here, go back into edit that toolpath, and rather than the top height basically being how far down the tool can reach, I'm going to go selection, select that face, remove the offset and hit OK. And what that does now is that brings the bottom of the tool, limits it from going down, brings it up to that face as a maximum. It can now do the circle because it's going to go in at a height and just cut a circle. But this again isn't very good to do. You'll see why now when I simulate. So what's going to happen here is it's going to come in at some point. There we go. It's going to cut and it's going to leave this horrible island there and it's going to do exactly the same on the circle here it's going to leave that horrible island there maybe that's the look you're going for um but yeah but it's just to show you you know you might have maybe roughed that out before so you won't get the pocket but it's just to show you that if you don't let's duplicate that if you don't adjust that top height of course it just cuts down as deep as it can cut um, and it won't do circles because it can just it'll literally just plunge straight down which you shouldn't be doing with the tool the tool won't thank you for it um, that's why it lets you do it in drilling because drills are meant to be plunged straight down so yeah um, that was probably the quickest live stream I've ever done it was a nice easy one thanks very much to the couple of people that suggested this a few weeks ago um, what suggestions have we got Spence? I know we've got Engraving on a cylindrical object. What else have we got suggestions? Yeah, a couple of a uh, couple of really great topics actually. Um, cut to compensation. Yeah, definitely. Um, that seems like a a widely requested topic, not only on the live streams but also in the uh, support forums as well. So I'll happily do that. Um, we have. Uh, Rui Lopez from Portugal on the live stream. A, a late check-in from Rui. Um, we've also got an interesting question actually about engraving uh, sequential serial numbers. Okay. So for each part, the number actually increments each time. Okay. I'll have a little look around for articles, and if I find anything, I'll put it in the description below. So yeah. make sure you check out the description below. Okay. So on that one again. Um, 
we don't do that for Insider Fusion uh, unless you want to remodel it every time. Because of course we make an a NC code that is what, what, what I refer to as a static file. Once we post it out of Fusion, unless you want to manually edit it, it's not going to change. So the machine will just do the same thing over and over and over again. But what we can look at doing um, is looking at uh, macros from machine tools. I know Hass have a macro that engraves a number, which is the value of a macro variable. So sorry if I'm talking a foreign language to anyone out there, but macro variables are basically like temporary storage locations on a controller. It's just a big table of empty boxes that you can do. So what you can do is you can have a, a, um, a macro variable that starts off at one, and you can actually give it give the, the has a, a sub-program that will engrave the value of that macro variable. And then at the end of the cycle, you do something like hash 500 equals hash 500 plus one. And that just adds one to the end of hash 500, so macro variable 500. So that now becomes two. You run the cycle, it engraves two. It adds one to it, it becomes three. Next time around, it engraves three. That was like a 10 second talk about something that is really quite complex. So whoever that was, if you want to chuck it back on the forum, um, we'll have a look if we can help you. We we can't help you really very much if the machine you've got doesn't support a cycle like that, because um, we can't do those sorts of can cycle. We can't make a can cycle from with, with inside of Fusion. Um, but if you've got a text engraving can cycle on your controller, I'll more than happily help you do one or two mini post mods and get that running. Yeah. Perfect. I think that's a really good explanation, Rich. Uh, I've also found a way of potentially doing it in the API. Ooh. Um, there's a forum through on that. I'll post it down below. In the, but won't that involve reposting NC code every time? Maybe. I believe it will. But anyway, yeah, it's it's everything's possible with an amount of time and effort. But yeah, let us know what machine you've got and what different things, and we'll talk about how we can hopefully work through with you. Absolutely. And if you're loving the live streams, don't forget to give the video a like, big thumbs up. Um, and don't be afraid to subscribe. If you subscribe, make sure you press that little bell icon and you'll uh, receive notifications of all the videos we post, not just the live streams, but all of the uploads from Tips and Tricks yeah. to the live stream. Software, as well as all our upcoming uh, live streams. Yeah. Brilliant. Again, everyone, thanks very much for watching. We really appreciate your time. Um, and mainly the interaction. It makes life a lot easier for us with a, a good bit of interaction in there. Um, I believe we're on next week as well. So see you all next week um, and stay safe. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone.